can you hear me well? Yeah, perfect. So um, uh, we are here as co-editors of uh, Hot Pictures. Here you can get a glimpse. And um, before I start the presentation of the magazine, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, the organizers of today's event uh, for the invitation and for helping us prepare the presentation. Uh, John, Joanna, uh, Sam, thank you so much, and Marluz. Um, so uh, let's start. Oops, here maybe we will need our um, presentation. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so I will start with the presentation of the journal and I'll pass it on to Giacomo in a bit. Thanks. Thanks. Our contribution today uh, to the debate around the environmental impact of digital images um, is a discussion of the issue you just saw, hot pictures, that uh, looked at the environmental impact, the production, distribution and circulation of digital images and specifically images uh, mediating climate change and ecological degradation. Um, so I will start uh, with a quick introduction of what is it that we do at Resolution, uh, what Resolution is, uh, and how the topic of this first issue came to be. Uh, so I'll take you briefly through the issue um, and then focus on one contribution uh, that reflects on how visuality and in general the desire to see uh, is connected to profit uh, and more specifically geological prospection technologies. Uh, so at resolution, uh, we like to think of resolution in the double sense of the term. Uh, firstly, resolution in the meaning uh, in its meaning within today's discussion, uh, the level of details of digital images. And secondly, resolution in the sense of creating a cultural product that has a certain uh, agenda, a certain set of resolutions. So uh, we were aiming for a magazine that is not only about something, contemporary art, contemporary photography, but one that incessantly departs from the same set of questions. Firstly, um, we think uh, about circulation and distribution of the magazine seriously, uh, in which case, in, in which, which in our case means that the magazine does not circulate online. We rather see it as a dissection table for analyzing uh, digital images cut loose uh, from their native circulation, which is screens big and small. Uh, and secondly, um, the question that comes back in all the issues is the same, is simple, uh, namely, how do digital images impact reality? So um, this is a question that kind of came up through a discussion we had around three years ago um, um, around the very specific kind of images that you can see here. So we tried to answer this question, how do digital, ima uh, digital images impact reality? Not in abstracto, but um, quite literally. So this image that you see here is an image of, uh, from, taken from Airbnb. Uh, so in 2008, the platform launched a service uh, offering free photographers uh, to visit the places that are to be rented out, to take pictures, uh, and then uh, these pictures taken by professional photographers were sent back uh, to the headquarters of Airbnb and they were heavily curated uh, and also photoshopped in very specific ways um, that created this kind of very homogenizing um, environment, decorations. And as these, um, as let's say different commentators have argued, um, these images are epitomic uh, of how we come to define homeness today, how homeness is commodified and uh, how this homogenization, um, let's say, has also um, homogenized a certain kind of uh, interior environments around the globe. Uh, this imagery, most importantly, um, uh, has gained, which has gained steam in the last 10 years, one could say, has affected the way we actually uh, imagine, envision and decorate our homes. Uh, so this kind of digital image had a very uh, distinct impact um, um, on reality and very much encapsulated what we are interested in doing at Resolution. Uh, so uh, what we're interested in researching, 
the performative agency uh, digital images have also beyond the realm of the digital or uh, the computational or um, their native environment, as I said before. So we firstly investigated that with a pilot issue, uh, uh, number zero, uh, that looked at the pixel. Um, and um, by looking at this building block of the digital image um, through a technical, ethical, and political uh, point of view, and especially kind of the political potential of uh, pixelized and ro low resolution images. For hot pictures, the impetus was quite different. Um, it was twofold and paradoxical. So on the one hand, it seems um, the most effective way to incite political action and raise awareness about climate uh, crisis um, is to see images of those places. It seems that we need to see images of ravaged landscapes, views of ecological disasters to engage with the damages, uh, ecological, political, migratory, uh, financial, of increasing pollution. Um, so the visual rhetoric of climate change, as you can see here, uh, you know, is, has become, um, and its problematic nature, as we will be discussing further, uh, has been debated time and again. And uh, I would say that the image has been a loyal companion to, ever, to the environmental movement, um, say, since its inception, so also before digital images. On the other hand, however, the production uh, of those same images um, that are supposed to alert us and raise awareness uh, about the climate on the verge of destruction has adverse environmental effects. Uh, here, I'm just giving two quite blatant examples of these effects. Uh, the carbon footprint, for example, of streaming media is estimated by some uh, to be 1% of uh, global greenhouse emissions. Uh, another example is the film industry in Los Angeles, uh, which is apparently the city's worst environmental offender after oil refining. Um, another example, and some of you, I guess, engaged with this this morning, is what our... Um, cell phones, what our smartphones are made of uh, um, anyway. Uh, and the figures that you see uh, here that I just mentioned uh, have only uh, grew up since the beginning of the pandemic. So it appears then that it is not only uh, the images of climate disaster that we see that matter very much, but also their production, circulation, reception and distribution. So the premise for all the commissions of hot pictures was um, an understanding of the image uh, as an industrial act of production before anything else. So before its circulation and reception as an image that is supposed to awaken environmental feelings. So the question that we ask is, what are we exactly supposed to do um, if images seem to be our last resort to understand the immensity of the climate crisis? Uh, if images are, in fact, one could say, complicit to a certain extent uh, with that same crisis. Uh, rather than providing a prescriptive answer uh, to this admittedly rhetorical question, uh, we can debate it afterwards, um, the issue of hot pictures uh, proposes that the how, in the how we get to see images of climate disaster matters very much. Uh, what kind of media and online platforms are put to work to aid us see the climate, uh, and by extension, the climate uh, disaster? And in attempting to uh, answer that question, an additional comes up. What is the aftermath of the climate crisis, image viewing, uh, and their attendant circulation? What kind of material labor relations precede that aftermath? Um, so what happens before images? become images and also after images become images. And here, this is a read from a text that might have been discussed already, Yusuf Arika's uh, Geology of Media, where he says um, this idea of before media become media. So we kind of like ask that question of the before and the after of the image specifically. In short, um, the visual media through which we get to see climate change can no longer be dismissed. So this question, we researched it through various contributions. Um, we had both artist contributions and more scholarly contributions. We had an essay around the tight rapport between the film industry and the oil industry. 
Um, we had um, uh, what we call debates in the journal, and Giacomo will speak more about that, where we kind of put into friction a contemporary author with a historical text. Um, we had a dialogue between art historian Caroline Jones and contemporary artist Matthew Wilson um, about uh, the energetic roots of any um, act of image production, and also an artist contribution that I will be discussing uh, right now by Dutch artist uh, Femke Gerdegrave um, that produced a visual essay about something um, yeah, that I will say uh, with uh, for a bit now. Uh, that looks at the tight connection between visuality and profit, uh, and especially uh, in the case of the mining industry. So some of you might be familiar with what is a digital twin. Um, it is a model that integrates the physical and digital worlds uh, for the sake of intelligent manufacturing, as the industry calls it. Um, I would say it comes close to a simulation, uh, but maybe um, the difference is the, a matter of scale. Um, so um, while a simulation typically studies one particular uh, process, a digital twin can itself run any number of useful simulations in order to study multiple processes. Uh, unexpectedly, those, energy, uh, heavy, those are energy heavy operations um, and maybe it would be an interesting exercise to trace the ecological footprint of digital twins. Uh, so it is applied uh, within many domains, healthcare, power generation, infrastructures, and urban planning. And right now, uh, an industry that has not yet, is kind of lagging behind in uh, the utilization of digital twins is the mining industry. And this is what Femke's contribution looks at. Um, so she created this work entitled When the Dust uh, Settles which invites us to walk into a virtual mine. So she walked around the, a digital twin of a mine that does not yet exist in the world. So usually digital twins uh, are actually modeled on a real object. In the geological sector, however, um, they're increasingly used for mines that are not yet existent. So using uh, the kind of data that have, let's say, covered where the ores are, let's say. Um, so, in this virtual environment, the mine consists of data points, pixels, polygons, gigabytes, polluted ecosystems, colorful, slick renderings. All digital elements that foreshadow forms of material violence. Dust, toxic fumes, polluted ecosystems, particles entering human lungs, endangered species, depleted landscapes. So, uh, through that contribution, um, what we can kind of boldly uh, state is that uh, in the form, uh, let's say that profit in the form of geological ores circulates visually before it can circulate materially. So visuality precedes profit. Uh, what the increasing, let's say, utilization of digital twins within the geological sector also tells us is that mining and geological prospection uh, start polluting before they actually exist in the world, before they're actually implemented. Uh, and uh, as we know, in the last years, important work has been done uh, from the field of like um, media studies, mostly uh, about the tight rapport between um, uh, media and their material components, uh, and especially the long-standing relation between photography and extraction. And what we found staggering at resolution about the case of the digital twin of the mine is this idea um, that at this stage, we seem to have reached a threshold where imagely, images are in fact um, becoming a necessity prior to the act of extraction itself, uh, which would amplify or exemplify uh, this kind of tight connection between images and geological strata. And now we'll pass it on to Giacomo, who will pick up on the idea of extraction, perhaps from a more historical point of view. I will try. Uh, thank you very much, here, Kivelli. Uh, thank you, everyone who is here uh, today. Uh, sorry for my strong Italian accent. If uh, you don't understand something, please interrupt me. Uh, <laughs> um, so, my, um, as a co-editor of um, a resolution, my role uh, was um, trying to raise uh, historical questions about uh, uh, the images that uh, uh, today 
um, on the one hand, uh, represent uh, the climate change and the um, ecological disasters, and on the other, as we said, contribute uh, with their existence to the same process they try to, to testify and maybe to uh, raise our attention uh, to. Uh, so, um, reflecting the, my invitation for, for today, for me, was a very, very good occasion to uh, think again about what I've learned uh, researching this topic, because uh, I have to say, after many months uh, uh, developing uh, questions and trying to find answers to, to these questions, um, my aim, own gaze towards the images that surround us changed. And um, what you see uh, in this slide uh, is one of the illustrations that comes from the magazine uh, that we tried to print uh, uh, with an um, uh, algorithm that Ovin uh, developed and then he, he will tell us about uh, uh, his own research. Um, what you see is what probably is one of the first representation uh, of mines. So we go uh, in the magazine from, the, from a mine that yet does not exist, it's only a digital model, uh, a project, uh, back uh, in the day uh, to the um, 16th century, uh, when uh, this artist, uh, uh, a Netherlands um, artist called uh, Henri Medeble, um, started uh, a little series of, uh, of mines and this painting is in the Uffizi Gallery, so if you <laughs> visit Florence, you can see one of the first images of uh, industrial development. Um, the person that um, opened, at least for me, um, this perspective about the history of, of art and the history of, of uh, images in general is Francis Klingender, uh, who was an English uh, art historian that worked uh, um, in the first part of the uh, 20th century, and is the author of a very important book, uh, I believe, uh, titled Art and the Industrial Revolution. Um, and, and it was published in uh, 1947. <coughs> um, it is a very um, important book, I believe, for today, uh, because uh, Klingender uh, already envisioned an approach to the history of the image, um, looking uh, to create a category uh, of images that uh, tells the story of uh, industrialization, which is a very specific uh, uh, cut uh, in the domain of uh, uh, art history. Um, the idea of visual culture didn't exist yet, so the um, study of Klingender was um, uh, aimed to retrace uh, artists that worked uh, uh, mostly uh, in Scotland and in, in the UK uh, representing the first days uh, of industrialization. So what happens to the landscape uh, when uh, the uh, industrial, uh, in, industrial construction come, uh, uh, are, are, being, are being built? So you, you, you see in this book uh, images of the first uh, railroads, uh, you see uh, images uh, of the first iron bridges, and, uh, and, this and so on. Um, I invited uh, um, Christof Professor Christopher Hoyer, who is an art historian working at the University of Rochester, uh, to comment uh, uh, on this book uh, of Klingender. And so in the, in the um, uh, magazine you find um, an essay by Hoyer. And uh, for today I put on the slide uh, a quote uh, um, from Professor Hoyer <coughs> that um, struck me among the many ideas that he put forward uh, in his text. Uh, the default means of environmental destruction and transmission remains realism. So, as we saw uh, before, we are accustomed to um, ask to the images that tells us about the current um, problematic situation the quality of realism. We want, uh, we want the truth. We want to see what is really happening. Um, but this could not be always the, uh, the case. So, uh, why, um, for example, so my... my I try to, to ask some question. Uh, why the, uh, don't we don't ask to this kind of images also to, to make us um, fantasize about a different world, for example? Um, another important thing that uh, Hoyer wrote for me, or something that prompted me to think a lot, um, was this phrase. Once the sublime was natural, now it has become uh, technological. 
Um, so this idea of the technological sublime, uh, I think it resonates a lot with uh, the topics uh, that are in the uh, cultural debate of the last two years, mostly also after the, the COVID uh, pandemic and the rise of the um, artificial intelligence. Um, what is more sublime, sublime with te uh, technological than the artificial intelligence that every day occupies uh, the titles of the newspaper? Um, we can think, so, uh, via Klingender and Hoyer, uh, to a long, uh, a long history of, uh, of visuality, uh, in which the um, human beings were confronted, firstly, uh, with, the, uh, with a landscape deprived of the presence of, uh, of human construction, uh, a landscape that slowly uh, becomes populated by uh, a technology that uh, accelerates uh, its presence, and uh, the perspective of Klingender uh, let us also um, see with new eyes uh, artworks that we are accustomed to, uh, that um, reveal uh, an aspect that normally pass maybe overlooked, uh, the Serra um, uh, Island of La Grande Jatte is in every art history book, but uh, a few times you see it accompanied with its, um, the opposite panel, that is a, a little bit uh, smaller, uh, the Bathers of Asnier, which precedes the Lagrange Jard by two years, maybe is a, is a composition a, bit, a little bit less interesting, but in the background you can see uh, a chimney uh, with the smog coming. So the Klingender approach let us see new things, uh, in the, um, also in the tradition, for example, uh, of uh, French Impressionism, and that is a, another topic that we addressed uh, with the intervention of Caroline Jones uh, in, the, in the essay. And uh, for me, this was very important because uh, uh, I always talked about the impressionist as these guys going around uh, in the landscape looking for the beautiful uh, uh, paysage. But then in this very paysage, you find testimony of what now concerns us the most. And um, I wanted also to add to, the, to this slide um, a panel from a manga artist called uh, Tsotumunihei, maybe. Um, the manga is called Blame. And um, in my opinion, it is uh, one of the best artistic reflection uh, about the, uh, what will be of the landscape uh, at the end of this process uh, that seems to fill the earth with human construction. Uh, Nihei uh, invented this um, uh, sci-fi world where the surface of the earth is completely uh, covered by uh, constructions. Uh, the protagonist of the manga uh, roam uh, in this space without never seeing neither uh, the sky and neither the, the soil. So everything is a, is a big construction and there are uh, machines that automat automatically build and destroy um, the architecture, but without the reason or at least without the reason comprehensible to us, the readers or the protagonist of the story that is set in this world. So I really uh, recommend you to, to check out this, uh, this work if you want to think about uh, a possible uh, uh, end for this history of landscape occupied by uh, <laughs> humans. Um, another idea that came uh, after we work on uh, hot pictures uh, um, I passed a lot of time, uh, I think, as a lot of us um, with the social networks, especially as an image junkie, uh, I, cannot do, I cannot pass a day without looking at the Instagram. And uh, an account that really struck me is this project, which is called Pixel Austerity. Um, it's an um, anonymous account that publishes uh, um, sometimes uh, a lot of uh, um, very interesting, very interesting uh, ideas. For example, this meme or poster uh, says staring at your phone isn't going to stop ice caps from melting. Uh, but what are we doing uh, every day, even walking in the street? Uh, every wasted pixel is a waste of Earth's resources. Um, the quality of your ideas is not intrinsically linked to the number of pixels. Uh, as much as they are provocative, uh, I think these are very serious uh, uh, puns. 
because they um, contribute uh, to uh, raise a, a kind of um, ecological uh, consciousness uh, in us, both as viewers and as consumers and as produ producers, maybe. And uh, the Pixel Austerity account is a very um, good, good space to meditate about our digital uh, practices. Um, I don't know how much time we, um, we still have. Um, maybe five, five, five minutes is okay. Um, another uh, um, change of perspective that uh, happened to me uh, while working to uh, resolution uh, was this. Uh, maybe some of you know the uh, history uh, uh, told by Pliny the Elder in the Natural History. Uh, about the origin of painting. So uh, it's the, 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 the place where the um, Western tradition um, finds the, it's the original idea about how images are made. Uh, what Pliny says in the book uh, 35, uh, he discusses the, the arts, the materials of the arts, and the first paintings and uh, sculptures. Um, he tells the story. Uh, the idea is that the, um, People uh, started painting, retracing shadows projected uh, on a wall. Um, apparently, Butades, a potter from Sicyon, was the first to invent in Corinth the art of modeling portraits in the earth, which he used in his trade. Uh, so the image, again, precedes uh, the, model, the 3D modeling. Uh, it was through his daughter that he made the discovery, who, being deeply in love with a young man about to depart on a long journey, traced the profile of his face as thrown <coughs> upon the wall by the light of a lamp. Upon seeing this, her father filled in the outline by compressing clay upon the surface and so made a face in relief, which he then hardened by fire along with other articles of pottery. Uh, so this is a, a, a super famous story that was uh, thought uh, for centuries, uh, but I think maybe only today our attention is drawn by the passage that they put in bold. Uh, by the light of the lamp. Uh, so how this lamp was, was made? Uh, which is the energy resource that uh, lies this lamp? And these kind of questions are possible uh, maybe uh, only today. So uh, even the, um, this perspective that we open with the uh, pictures and in general the, pers the, sp the perspective open, open by environmental humanities um, is able also to um, reinterpret or to ask new questions to the, to the tradition we, we are part of. And um, just to, to close very briefly, uh, I mentioned before this, uh, this idea uh, of the presence of the AI, which of course is uh, more than important for everything that, that relates to the, to the image. Uh, as for my uh, research, uh, I'm attracted to uh, the algorithm that you probably all know the generative uh, algorithms that let us um, create images uh, starting from text uh, uh, inputs. Uh, images that uh, for the moment we continue to see in small format uh, on the screens of the, of the telephones. Uh, images that require a lot of computational data uh, to be created, uh, shared <laughs> and, uh, and reproduced. And uh, mm, from our approach, uh, um, uh, a question towards the developers of the AI and the industry will be uh, what will happen when these images that now are um, generated in a very, very slow, uh, low resolution because the uh, models work on uh, images who are uh, 512 12 pixel um, squares. Uh, but of course, uh, we, we all know the dimension of the first daguerreotype. Uh, we know the dimension of the positive. And we know that now we can take the pictures of the, of the universe uh, uh, with the Hubble telescope. So what will happen in 50 years? And everything uh, appears to be directed towards the expansion of the resolution of this kind of images. That, of course, uh, entails uh, a bigger consumption of energy and resources for the creation and the circulation. Um, so, I, I, of course, I, I've not, uh, I don't have a, an answer to what we're going to see, uh, but if, I think this is a very big problem that maybe um, a, design, a new design approach uh, that Ovin uh, will tell us about uh, could resolve or, or at least try to, to tackle. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank so this was uh, <laughs> Thank you. Hello, hi. Um, so I think we have time for uh, two questions at least. So if you want to ask anything, Kivel and Giacomo, thank you so much for this presentation. There is a mic, Aria can... I can start by... Oh, perfect. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really, really interesting. I was just looking through the, um, the magazine that circulated and I saw that... Um, almost all of the pictures were kind of compressed in a very particular style. And I was just wondering uh, how that was achieved and obviously what was the thinking behind that. Thank you. And the, the next speaker uh, <laughs> is, the, is, the, is the author uh, okay. uh, of yeah. the... Of the color assimilation grid. Um, so yeah, maybe we're not gonna reveal a lot, but uh, yeah, it's uh, something that kind of reduces the color, by reducing the colors of the image also reduces the size of the image. And I guess perhaps what we did at Resolution is also that this is a tool that is created for digital images, but we use it in print. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Thoughts, questions? Yeah, I can see a hand almost <laughs> raising, okay. <laughs> Which, which sort of images have the biggest environmental impact, sort of in general, would you say? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think also is, um, um, there, is, there is an epistemological problem when we speak about uh, the impact of uh, digital images and the circulation. Because on the one hand, uh, the people who are interested in uh, um, find out about ah, what is the amount of uh, energy used of the co consumption uh, of these images, they don't have access to the data because of course the data are owned and produced by the corporations that uh, we, we all know um, manage the circulation and the production of the images. So uh, it's very difficult, I was trying to, to look into this, uh, into this topic but uh, I learned that uh, we, we have some figures but also the figures change every day Every new technology uh, puts another question or another uh, uh, um, possibility of, of consumption. And um, even when we see uh, data, it seems like um, either the data comes from the corporation, so we can expect that the, they want to tell us their story, uh, or the data is collected from a public researcher that does not have, of course, access to uh, all the information that will be needed to assess the overall uh, uh, panorama. Um, if you look at the um, documents uh, um, released by the COP27 uh, in the last in Summer Shake, um, you, can read, you can read the documents. And what the, the, um, the big players that are there that are trying to say is that we already are going to surpass the limits that we, we were dreaming to not surpass. And they are already producing uh, um, managerial concepts, uh, trying to say, mm -hmm. and now we will have to be resilient. Uh, we have to change uh, how we live. But of course, we are not going to change how we consume. Uh, we are going to change how we live. Uh, so uh, for, for, th for them, is already we are already in this scenario. And they are public, these documents, so I, I suggest you to, to read them. Uh, there is a website with the results, and you can find more, uh, more from there. Perhaps to add uh, a bit on that, um, it's also, I guess, what's interesting to think in this question, so what kind of images have the biggest environmental impact, is like what kind of calculations do we do? So, for example, the example <laughs> that we gave of the digital twin, I mean, this, we would, this image wouldn't even be considered an image in the first place, because if we would think about the environmental impact of the mining industry, we wouldn't include that image, you know? So it's all, not only what kind of, uh, the, I guess, not only what kind of data we have access to, but, but what kind of stages of the production of the image we include in the measurement of the impact of environmental images. Um, and secondly, I also, while preparing that presentation, this is also quite a good question because both Giacomo and I are unable to answer it, but I also believe that maybe Marluz will have some insight into that. Um, that for me, uh, the most accurate study of the impact of 
to say streaming images of the film industry was from 2006 to my knowledge and online I was maybe I didn't use the right keywords but online this sustainability in the motion uh, picture industry uh, yeah online I couldn't find anything more uh, recent which is um, yeah quite telling in itself perhaps thanks comment there perhaps is that mm -hmm. satellite images yes, allow yes, us yes, to yes. know the damage mm -hmm. they do to the environment mm -hmm. and planet as well so mm -hmm. they have a big impact yeah but mm -hmm. the satellites are like mobile phones <laughs> and very expensive to make mm -hmm. and get up in orbit yeah 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 and what are they made of also perhaps mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. satellite yeah. images probably yeah. Yeah. cool in both directions yeah <laughs> <laughs> um do you have any final question for Kivali and Giacomo. I would like to ask uh, a question if no one else is um, wanted to say something. I just thought it was very interesting that point about um, fantasizing and realism, that there's no fantasizing, but it's not, there's a lot of realism. So I really, this sort of speculative <coughs> question that I wanted to uh, ask you is what kind of questions from your kind of research and from your practice, what are the kind of questions that you think uh, people that kind of uh, work around uh, or study around these topics should be asking if they want to fantasize a different sort of uh, way of doing things or I mean it's speculative mm -hmm. you don't have to have an answer mm -hmm. but like uh, the, the, uh, look at the pixel austerity Instagram uh, every, every day <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead, of, instead of doing your prayer before, before going to the bed no it's um, <laughs> I, I really love this culture of the memes, uh, of the but being online. You're also a meme maker. Uh, maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but really, um, okay, the, the, there is the, 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 pers the personal impact. Are we going to look at the video of the cats uh, on, the, on the computer, or are we researching uh, uh, algorithms that uh, aid, help us <coughs> to compress uh, uh, the images? It's a lot about uh, our personal... Uh, uh, behavior, uh, of course, uh, but our personal is connected to, to the social, uh, so we are inside this, uh, this together. I, I think that from the point of view um, of design and of, um, there is a lot, there, there's still a lot to, to do, uh, there's still a lot uh, possible, and I'm not this kind of person, but for example, why um, this pixelated uh, style, for example, cannot be the new fashion? Uh, in, the, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our visual culture. Uh, maybe in 30, 40 years th th this will be the case for the, for the young teens that are uh, uh, part of the um, Friday for Futures movement. Maybe they also they can uh, raise these uh, uh, concerns toward the, the images and the, the consume. Mm. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe for me, well, my own, in, in my own personal work, I actually deal more with uh, the materiality of analog photographic practices. Mm. Um, so something that really strikes me is that the, the moment we start documenting uh, landscapes that are impacted by uh, industrial activities is also, of course, the moment that photography is born. Uh, so what I see in, uh, in different contemporary artistic practices today uh, is practices that kind of revisit this initial materiality of the image quite literally by using the, I know, bitumen. So the first photograph uh, of Niebs is made by something called bitumen, which is a derivative of oil. Um, yeah, so people working with this kind of material. So, and this produces a very specific kind of aesthetic, which is images that don't really represent anymore the landscape. It's just the landscape becomes something ab abstract. Um, so I'm more and more drawn to this kind of very abstract, uh, this kind of non-pictorial representations of landscapes, if you will. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah? yeah? Is it too late? Sorry. Okay. No, 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 please um, do. So, uh, back to the do we need a mic for that, guys? Sorry. Yeah, just for the recording, really. No? Oh, okay. So um, going back to the slide about the motion picture industry, um, 
how, how much would you say you would attribute that also to the CGI industry, which um, plays a very large role in the motion picture industry right now? I think it's a very, very good question. Uh, because on the one hand, of course, the CGI let us uh, imagine more, uh, but also reduce the cost of production uh, of a movie. Uh, instead of blowing up a car and destroying a, a building, if I can do on the, on the PC, uh, of course, I can tell a story uh, with this kind of elements without uh, making a, a, big, uh, a big mess. Uh, what I see um, in the, not maybe in the close, close future, but in a future of 10, 15 years, um, is the <coughs> idea of uh, having the ability to create uh, um, static and moving images through the uh, AI and through the CG, CGI made by the AI accessible to each of one of us, not mm. only to the expert, uh, will have a, a, a massive impact uh, on the con energy consumption uh, uh, related to, to digital images. Because uh, who's going to stop each of, each one of us to make our own Spider-Man uh, movie, even just for the fun, where you have the ability uh, for free or for a very low cost uh, on your PC, mm -hmm. on your, on your uh, telephone, to, to, play, to play also uh, with, uh, with this kind of tools. Um, I'm, I'm, constant, I'm trying to track down what happens um, in the context of uh, generative AI, and, and every two, two days there is a new paper that advances the technology uh, in a way that uh, job dropping. Every day I'm like, ah. <laughs> ah, because it, it, it really uh, changes how you envision the, the future and, uh, of creativity, uh, of the arts. And it's like when the um, Kodak camera came in the uh, 80, 89, 80, 88, 1888, uh, I think, uh, everybody suddenly was a, was a photographer. Uh, in a few years, everybody will be a CGI uh, artist with this kind of technology. I think. I, I guess the reason I bring this up is that um, if you look at the statistics, um, a lot of the Pixar movies are actually some of the most expensive movies ever made. Um, and since then we've, um, and a lot of it comes from the fact that it's incredibly resource intensive to render a single frame of those image, uh, of those films. Um, so I, I would be curious to see what the environmental impacts of um, doing CGI for like big budget blockbuster films mm. is. Uh, I could comment a bit on the cost of the Pixar movies because the first kind of like Toy Story movie uh, took long, long time per frame to render. But not many, many years after that, you could actually render the first Toy Story movie in real time on a graphics card on a GPU on a PC. So instead of having like a huge server room full of computers doing the work and distributing and rendering one frame each and taking maybe a half an hour to create a frame, uh, you could take the description that they originally used and just play the movie from the description. So things are changing there as well. Um, so it's very hard to tell like where our technological process will take us. Thank you so much for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.